just get such a little bit, and then we have other council people robbing from this area, putting it in other areas. And that goes so back to this, a, this global picture where it, it, you target in on the blacks to take care of the black community, and that is unfair, because what happens on the council, that if blacks are not looking out for where the concentration of blacks are, then no one else bothers to do it. Okay, the dream is to have the centerpiece, the theater as a centerpiece, but the buildings that are across the street from the theater are between on the Union Street and the King's Road will be a whole district of buildings um, with um, restaurants. Your office could be just a place to work, or it could be a showcase for the company. The difference can be in the furniture and accessories you choose. The Ritz first opened its doors in 1929. This 600-seat auditorium was once a popular haven for Jacksonville's black theater goers. The Ritz and the surrounding La Villa area were once the shopping and entertainment mecca for Jacksonville's black community. And if the dreams of professional dancer Anthony Patterson come to life, this 60-year-old legacy and Jacksonville historic landmark will live once again. Anthony, why are you going to do it? I think it's important that a person's past be a part of their future. And out of four th black theaters that were in this community, this is the only one that's still standing. And I think it's important to the future of the black community, as well as the community of Jacksonville, that restore, we restore this theater and give the... Um, the community of Jacksonville, some kind of arts and entertainment district. We desperately need that kind of um, place. Now, now, as far as I know, you were not a part of, of the generation that the Ritz is a part of. I mean, I think you were you were about uh, 18 or so when the Ritz was already True. closed. Why the True. interest by you? You mentioned, of course, the past, but why the interest by you? I think a lot of young people in Jacksonville want to know uh, what happened and, and where the black community was in Jacksonville. And people like myself did not know until you start talking to old timers what used to go on here. And I think my sense of uh, preservation and my sense of arts and entertainment just led me to this gorgeous building. And I think this building lends itself perfectly to what, what we're trying to do. And also the area that this building sit will fit nowhere else in Jacksonville. It belongs right here. Black participation in Jacksonville city government goes back some 100 years. But that participation would end when cigar company owner George E. Ross left the city council in 1907. No other black American was to be elected to office in Jacksonville until 1967. There was some irony to the fact that some 58 years after Ross, it would be a black female who took office. Former school teacher Sally Mathis. She was later joined by restaurant owner Mary Little John Singleton. And yes, even though black men have taken the majority of elected posts since 1967, it is black female elected officials who remain the most scandal-free. On the council, Ms. Mathis served virtually alone as a female until being joined by Nancy Crabb in the 70s and Sylvia Tebow in the 80s. Mary Singleton went on to the state legislature. No black women have ever been elected to the Duval County School Board. Only one, Gwen Leapart, to the Civil Service Board, despite the fact that black women account for nearly half of the municipal government workforce. But when Ms. Mathis died from cancer in 1983, coupled with political scandals and defeats wrecking the careers of Earl Johnson, Rodney Hurst, Oscar Taylor, and most recently Don Gaffney, the opportunity for black women to rise into political prominence came swiftly. Of the dozen or so black elected officials now serving, four of them are black females. None of them have served in office more than a decade, but because of where they are politically, nearly every important issue that confronts Jacksonville comes across their desk. State Representative Corrine Brown was elected in 1982. She collected signatures in her first race, but coupled with a strong base of support from feminist groups, teachers, and longtime friends, she has beat back decisively two attempts to unseat her. She has also finished a stint as the first woman chair of the Duval Legislative Delegation. We have a rich history with um, Mary Singleton and uh, Sally Mathis, and of course Mary Singleton was the first woman ever elected to the Florida House of Representatives from Jacksonville. So, uh, and so she's done, and both of them, Sally, they, they did such a good job in setting, you know, very high standards that, you know, I feel that we have to work hard to adhere to.
Councilwoman Evelyn Denise Lee, appointed in 1983 to succeed Sally Mathis, she has consistently beat black male opponents, including a Baptist preacher and longtime union president in re-election bids. Her strength seems to lie in strong neighborhood ties and heavy support from black women who vote. Councilwoman Deirdre Mix benefited from Gaffney's decision to run for the legislature in 1986. The civil rights lawyer uses her legal training to assess council issues. This is the first time in history that I think it has been done, that um, we have four black females representing 160,000 people, or in excess of 160,000 people, two in the state and two on the uh, city council. Uh, that in itself is historical. Uh, it's probably um, the result of a number of different factors involved. Uh, I know that black men have had an opportunity to hold a position and have held a position on a city council level um, and also in the state. Um, but I can't think of any other city in the state of Florida where we have the, this type of representation on the city council level and at the state level. State Representative Betty Holzendorf only recently took her seat in Tallahassee after a two-year extortion scandal that found former University of Florida football hero Don Gaffney pleading guilty and resigning from office. Holzendorf beat out a high school coach, a FAMU alumni leader, and a Baptist preacher to take the Democratic nomination. She trounced a Republican HRS investigator for the District 16 seat. All of the opponents black men. She told us what she think is important. Fred, I think it's unique to understand that in most things that happen in the black community, behind the scenes, there were many persons who were active in organizing and getting things going and getting things started and doing a lot of the research. And basically, those were females. The males were out front because they did not want females out front in some of the instances of confrontation. So while it was a training ground for many of us to come out at this particular time and take the role of some of the positions as some of the males moved on to other things or eventually uh, died or, or sought other avenues of, of enforcing those principles that we were fighting for. Peaches Productions gratefully acknowledges the production and funding support provided by Southern Bell in Jacksonville, the Alfonso West Mortuary, Alfonso West, Deborah West White, and James Fraylin, directors, Sun Bank of North Florida, WAIV and WOKV radio stations, and First Union Bank of Jacksonville. <laughs>